Good morning and welcome to this, the seventh meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Can I make the usual request that electronic devices be switched on to uh, silent and off the desk? Um, agenda item one this morning is a decision on taking uh, business in private. So my uh, request to the committee is to consider taking agenda item three in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yeah, thank you very much. Agenda item two is the... UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill uh, scrutiny. And with us this morning, um, we have uh, Tobias Locke. You will know that last week the Scottish Government introduced the EU Continuity Bill to Parliament and that Parliament has agreed to treat the bill as an emergency bill. So yesterday the bill completed stage one of its consideration in the Chamber. Stage two amendments to the bill will be considered by the Finance and Constitution Committee next week and MSP should note the deadline for that is 2pm tomorrow, Friday the 9th of March. Um, section five of the bill seeks to save the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in, in Scots law and as it applies to all devolved matters. So that's an area of interest for this committee this morning. And as members will know since late 2016, this committee has been keeping an eye uh, and a watching brief on the implications of leaving the EU on equalities and human rights. And we've held a number of evidence sessions to that point. Um, we held an evidence session on the EU withdrawal bill last year and the aim of this morning's session is to inform members about the detail of the EU continuity bill before the deadline of stage two amendments closes tomorrow. As we know, the introduction of the bill is a significant development in terms of the remit of this committee, and as members will know, other committees, and I believe all committees now, are taking evidence on the implications of the bill. We expect uh, that as the Brexit process moves forward, the committee will continue to inform itself, the Parliament and the wider public debate with further evidence sessions on the implication for equalities and human rights. At our very first session of the topic in 2016, we heard from Tobias Locke of the University of Edinburgh on the implications of Brexit. And we're very uh, happy to have Tobias back at committee today. But I know your time's very tight this morning because you're going from this committee to the European, uh, the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee as well. So we're very grateful that you could fit some time in for us this morning. Next week, we will hear from the Minister, Mike Russell, um, and we should direct some of our political questions to him next week. But this morning, Tobias, I'm delighted to have you here and we are hoping you'll have a very brief opening statement. Yes, thank you. I, I just thought, well, thanks for inviting me uh, today. Uh, and I, I just thought I'd briefly run through what the Charter does at the moment, what it would do or will do if the EU withdrawal bill is adopted and what the differences are under this bill that we're discussing here, the Scottish Continuity Bill. So at the moment, as you know, the Charter protects a host of rights, including all the rights that we have in the Human Rights Act. But it is, of course, binding primarily on the EU and its institutions and on the member states, but only when they are implementing European Union law. Um, this means that at the moment, an EU Act, EU legislation, can be challenged on the basis of the Charter, and it can be declared invalid by the European Court of Justice, and this challenge can be brought in a Scottish court, uh, which then would refer the case up to the ECJ for a decision. The fact that the Charter is binding on the member states when they are implementing EU law means that whenever a member state applies EU law, an EU directive, an EU regulation, or whenever it deviates from EU law, saying we would like to invoke a public policy exception, it has to exercise its discretion that it has in accordance with the Charter, in accordance with fundamental rights. And it also has to ensure that the procedures that it applies are compliant with the Charter. In particular, the right to an effective remedy under Article 47 of the Charter, which is broader than the right to an effective remedy under the Human Rights Act, because it doesn't exclude administrative disputes, broadly speaking. The Charter also offers slightly different remedies to what we know under domestic law. The Charter comes with the primacy of EU law and it can be used in an extreme case to lead to the disapplication, the non-application of an act of the Westminster Parliament, which is a remedy that doesn't exist under domestic UK law at all. Uh, the best you can get under, under the Human Rights Act is a declaration of incompatibility, which doesn't have any immediate legal effects on the case. Now, the EU withdrawal bill, now, of, of course, uh, in, the, in the Scottish context, we've got Section 29 of the Scotland Act, which does not allow this Parliament to 
act in a way that is contrary to the Charter, provided it is acting within the scope of EU law, it is implementing EU law. So whenever there's a connection with EU law, this Parliament cannot violate the Charter at the moment. Uh, and the same goes for the Scottish Government. Under the Withdrawal Bill, uh, the Withdrawal Bill would not, expressly not make the Charter part of retained EU law, this new category of, 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 of law that, that it uh, creates. But instead, it says that the general principles of EU law do continue to be applicable in the UK legal order. And part of these general principles are unwritten human rights. And as you probably know, the Charter was only made uh, uh, binding in 2009. Before that, the EU legal order relied on unwritten fundamental rights that have been developed by the Court of Justice largely to the same effect as charter rights. So the EU withdrawal bill incorporates those, but it doesn't incorporate the charter, which is slightly problematic because at first we don't know whether the charter uh, and the uh, general principles are identical. They probably aren't. They're, they're, I think the charter develops fundamental rights a little bit, at least. And secondly, it leads to a degree of legal uncertainty if you're relying on unwritten rights rather than written ones, if you have them available. Um, another thing that the, the EU withdrawal bill does is it excludes uh, an, uh, the possibility to challenge EU law, EU legislation that has been retained on the basis of the Charter or on the basis of fundamental rights. So it can't, as, as soon as you could have a situation, say you've got an EU regulation after the, that, that is in force now is transformed into domestic law by virtue of the EU withdrawal bill. After that, the European Court of Justice comes along and says, well, actually, this was not valid because something it was incompatible with charter rights. It would still be unchallengeable in the UK legal order. So this, uh, and, and the EU withdrawal bill does this for, for, uh, as, as a general rule. So these can't be challenged. But what's more important is actually that the EU withdrawal bill expressly says there cannot be a cause of action, a right of action, on the basis of the general principles of EU law, that is, on the basis of any EU fundamental rights. So they, their role is now confined, or will be confined, to helping with the interpretation of EU regulations, EU directives that have been made part of domestic law by virtue of the EU withdrawal bill, this kind of retained EU law. So it's, 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 it's a much narrower role for these fundamental rights. Now, the Continuity Bill takes a different approach in many of these cases. I mean, obviously, it, it expressly incorporates the Charter. Um, and it also says that the Charter can give a right of action, which is important because it, that makes a material difference. You can go to court and say, look, I believe a Scottish... Uh, um, authority was acting within the scope of EU law here, or was implementing what is retained EU law here, and in doing so, they violated my fundamental rights under the Charter, and you've got a case, whereas under the EU withdrawal bill, this would not be possible, this approach would not work. You'd have to find some other hook, say the Human Rights Act or something else, in order to go ahead. Um, and I think that's, that's where I'll leave it for now. If, if that is okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, some very technical aspects in there, but we hope we can interrogate some of them as we go on this morning. I'm going to kick off with Jamie Green. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, uh, Tobias. Um, and thank you for that uh, opening uh, statement. It's very helpful. It's, uh, as you say, these are hugely technical and uh, legal matters. Um, your expertise is appreciated. Um, but I do get the impression from uh, the comments that you made uh, my reading of the way that you present that information is that your, your tone as such is not overly positive about the UK's EU withdrawal bill. Do you have a, a view on whether you think it uh, is adequate in terms of protecting equalities and human rights in the UK in any part of it? Well, I think the EU withdrawal bill could do better by doing two things. I think it, it, it should ideally incorporate the Charter simply to create a greater degree of legal certainty. Otherwise, 
we will see endless, I mean, it's, it's, it's good news for lawyers, of course, legal uncertainty, but uh, for the rest of, of the population, it's probably not so good. We will see endless uh, uh, um, argument in court as to whether a specific right was accepted as a general principle of EU law at the time of exit day, which is the crucial uh, point in time under the EU withdrawal bill, or not. And it's not that easy to, to do that because obviously the Court of Justice of the EU has stopped referring to the general principles of EU law when the Charter came in because they had a written document. So there's a legal certainty point more than uh, anything else. And of course, excluding the right of action means that in certain situations, people who would have a remedy now won't have one in the future. Now, that is a political choice. I mean, there is no obligation, and I don't think there will be an obligation under any agreement with the EU to continue to guarantee those rights. But uh, it's, it's just, uh, from a human rights perspective, it's, it's not, not optimal. Okay, I appreciate that answer. Um, so, uh, in that respect, given that the EU withdrawal bill is unlikely to change in its uh, policy, um, uh, if the Scottish continuity bill was to pass and adopt the Charter of Fundamental Rights, could we see a situation where uh, the EU withdrawal bill in Westminster passes without the adoption of the Charter and the Scottish bill passes with the adoption of the Charter? Where would that leave us in terms of the uh, uh, constitutional situation with regards to having two parallel uh, legal systems in a single uh, member state or sovereign state uh, whereby one is uh, adopting the charter the other is not what sort of conflict might that arise well i mean it is of course a possibility uh, as 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 the two bills currently stand as they were introduced they that that if, if they are adopted as they are that that's the that will be the consequence um the the problem is i think and that is a, a, a problem probably with a continuity bill as a, as a bill as such, it just adds another layer of complexity to the whole post-Brexit legal landscape, okay? So what I mean by this is, if we look at human rights, what we will have here in Scotland, from a Scottish perspective, we will have the Human Rights Act that will continue to exist as it does. We will have general principles of EU law as incorporated by the EU withdrawal bill, those general principles will be applicable to whatever is our reserved matters, broadly speaking. Uh, but these general principles, first of all, we don't know exactly what their content is. We have a, quite a good guess. We can make a good guess, but we don't know exactly what their content is. And secondly, they don't give a right of action. And then we will have, as far as devolved or retained, in brackets, devolved EU law is concerned under the a continuity bill, we will have the charter as well as the general principles, um, and they can give a right of action. And it, the problem is, of course, that individual cases, uh, real life scenarios, don't align themselves with the division of competences between the Scottish Parliament and the Westminster Parliament. So you could have a situation where you've got an individual who's got a human rights problem, and part of his or her claim. Uh, is based on reserved law. Part of her claim is based on devolved law, and so the, the, the case will actually split. So you might get a decision by a court that says, well, as far as this part of the claim is concerned, we can't give you a remedy as far as that part of the claim is concerned because it was a, re a reserved matter, something to do with housing, perhaps, or whatever. Uh, you, 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 we can apply the charter, and we can also give you, uh, grant you a right of action. So that, I mean, that is already happening. Uh, at the, uh, uh, it, in the UK legal order simply because the charter does not apply in every type of circumstance. It only applies when the member state is implementing EU law. So we've already got that situation in, in theory and there are cases where that has happened. But here we would be adding a third, a third layer, so to speak. Uh, and that just makes it more complex. Understood, thank you. Um, is there any precedence of any other uh, non-EU countries adopting the EU charter? Not that I'm aware of, no. So, it, it, so when the UK uh, leaves uh, the European Union and Scotland, and if Scotland passes this bill in two weeks' time, it will be a non-EU member state, but mm -hmm. will have incorporated uh, 
the EU charter fundamental rights into its domestic law. Is that, will that be the case? Well, it will have incorporated the charter in so far as retained EU law is concerned. And I suppose the idea is that this body of retained EU law will be shrinking over time because, um, you know, you will have new uh, measures uh, in environmental matters, you will have new measures in agricultural matters, and so on and so on, and they will no longer be retained EU law, and so the Charter won't apply to them. So whatever is, is, is changed, whatever has, will, will have been repealed, will be out with the scope of the Charter. So it's, it, it, the Charter will preside over a, a, a shrinking body of law. But of course, uh, uh, as you know, with uh, the way, the way um, parliaments work and politics works, even in 20 or 30 years' time, there will still be some measures that will be part of that category of law, and the charter would still apply to them. Now, whether there will be a charter case is a completely different matter, because mm -hmm. most of these t matters are rather technical. They don't raise human rights issues, but it, it could happen. Yeah. But, but just to pick up on your point there, that is on the assumption that this parliament repeals, uh, uh, or indeed introduces domestic law which would then supersede That's right, yeah. uh, those EU laws. So that's, a, a, in a sense, it's an unknown uh, that is if, right, because yeah. that, those would be decisions made by the Parliament in future years. Exactly. Indeed. There is no guarantee. I mean, obviously, this Parliament could decide to just sit still uh, and not change anything. Um, okay. That's true. Did you see any, uh, I won't keep, keep you too long, I know there's lots of other members in the committee and we're tight on time, but do you see any, any um, difficulties arising from uh, the intention of the continuity bill uh, coming into force in Scotland uh, in terms of its relation to um, the, the fact that there will be two parallel uh, um, systems um, in terms of, for example, right of action, um, or will it create any legal uncertainties or indeed any uh, other additional uh, problems that you think might may arise. I think part of our uh, probing today is really to look at all aspects, both the positive and the potential negative. So I wondered if you had any views on that you could share with us. Well, I think there will be an issue uh, if the EU withdrawal bill, the Westminster bill, um, extends to devolved matters as well. So if the Westminster bill were um, amended to say well, it doesn't apply to Scotland or something like that to, to take out whatever bits the continuity bill covers then at least there is you can create better legal certainties than if you have two bills claiming to be regulating the same or two acts claiming to be regulating the same aspects um, in which case there will be a degree of, of legal uncertainty I think. Okay thank you. I have some other questions Frankovich but I'll have to come back to it later. Yeah. Gail, did you want to come in with a quick supplementary? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, good morning. Um, Jamie Green asked about countries that are not in the EU adopting the European Charter. What about countries that are in EFTA? Um, the EFTA and, and, and the EEA uh, agreement do not contain a human rights charter. Okay, because, okay? I mean, it's, it's simply for historic reasons, uh, because they predate even early attempts at looking at, at, at putting together a charter. So they, they don't have it, uh, and they protect fundamental rights in accordance with their own systems. So they don't, they don't, they haven't incorporated the charter. Okay. I mean, one thing I should perhaps add uh, on that, if that is of interest to the committee. Of course, we've got the, the other European system, the ECHR system, and there is a tendency that the European Court of Human Rights will look at the Charter for inspiration, if you will, simply because the Charter, where it mirrors the Convention, has been a little bit updated. So, as I mentioned, uh, the, the right to an effective remedy before, in Article 6 of the Convention, it is confined to, to private law disputes and criminal, criminal matters. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't cover purely administrative uh, issues. And uh, Article 47 of the Charter gets rid of this anomaly, if you want. Um, similar, uh, another example would be that the, the Convention doesn't uh, protect the right to conscientious objection, 
it's, a, it's a historic uh, issue, of course, because it was adopted in 1950 or, or drafted in, in, in the early 50s, whereas um, the Charter recognizes that expressly. So it is a slightly more updated understanding of convention rights, and the European Court of Human Rights has in the past said whenever it, 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 it adopted a relatively progressive uh, interpretation of the convention, oh, let's look at the Charter, look at look what, what, what they think is, is, is the proper reading of, of this provision, in order to move uh, the law forward. So in that sense, indirectly, there are countries outside the EU that, that uh, 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 are covered by certain aspects of the Charter, but it's very indirectly, simply through an interpretation <coughs> of the European Convention on Human Rights in light of the Charter. And if the, when we leave the EU, if the UK was to bring forward its own bill of human rights, do you think it would um, mirror the Charter, or are there any aspects that should be updated? I could imagine that it will mirror, or it will update certain aspects of the Convention uh, of Civil and Political Rights. I am not sure whether the UK would adopt a... Um, a chapter on socio-economic rights, for instance, as, as the Charter has. Um, it might have stronger protections than the Charter in procedural rights, but uh, that is just guess, a guessing. You know. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring Mary in now, because I know that Mary's got a different area to focus on, but it's still focus on rights, and then I'll come back to Jamie on Frankovich. Is that okay, mm -hmm. Mary? Thank you, Convener, and good morning, um, Tobias. I wanted to just follow on from the question that um, Gail has just asked you about um, the, the UK government introducing its own Bill of Rights, if you like. If, if the Continuity Bill passes in this Parliament in a couple of weeks' time, and we sign up to the Charter, and after Brexit, the UK introduces a Bill of Rights, where does that leave us? Well... It, um, is, that's a good question. Uh, it, it, it would, I mean, a uh, Bill of Rights for the whole of the UK would probably um, cover uh, both uh, de the devolved authorities and devolved parliaments mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, the, the UK level. I would assume that the Scotland Act would be amended to, you know, the bit on the Human mm -hmm. Rights Act would be replaced by whatever, say, mm -hmm. UK Bill of Rights or whatever it would be called. Um, would this make any changes? Uh, would this make a difference to the Continuity Bill? Well, not immediately, of course. Um, the the uh, 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 Charter, as I said before, only will only apply to those bits of EU law that have been retained. Mm -hmm. Um, so it would continue. It wouldn't wreck this bill, in other words. The only thing it might add is an additional layer of uh, 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 rights that would have to be complied with were Scottish ministers to amend bits of retained EU law, were the Scottish Parliament to decide it wanted to change or, uh, mm -hmm. bits of retained EU law. So in that sense, there might be an overlap, but I don't think there would be, there would be a, a, an actual problem here. Okay, that, that's... that's helpful. Um, the other issue I wanted to ask you about was employment legislation, because much of our employment legislation has come um, from mm. Europe. Now, if the, the continuity bill passes, the, the, the current employment legislation that comes from Europe will be part of our, um, our, our law in Scotland? Um, I'm not so sure about this, because the continuity bill only saves devolve, I mean, that the test uh, is uh, that it only saves those bits of EU law that would be devolved, would be devolved or that the Scottish Parliament would have competence to uh, legislate on, were it not for Section 29. Mm -hmm. so, and I think most employment legislation would not be covered because it's reserved. So, if after our withdrawal from, from Brexit, I mean, I, I appreciate... That the, the spice paper that we have um, and the research that's been done says that any changes to employment law are likely to be slow and incremental. But if there was any slippage in employment law, if, if the UK government decided to do something that would fundamentally change a, a right and a protection that we currently have, in Scotland, could we do anything to protect those rights, to stop them being taken away? 
as, as far as I can tell, no, under the, under the current uh, uh, devolution settlement, that would be out with the competence of the Scottish Parliament. Mm. And no one, no one in Scotland would have any right of challenge then, no? Well, if it were done by ministers, uh, it could bring a judicial review because all the powers under the EU withdrawal bill, because they're secondary legislation, they're open to challenge. But um, if it was done by an act of the Westminster Parliament, there wouldn't be much that anyone could do about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jamie, do you want to come back in? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a fascinating subject. Um, just don't, picking you up on a comment you just made, uh, Tobias, you said that it would be out with the competence of the devolution settlement for, a de for this parliament to stop the with reduction or withdrawal of any human rights uh, that the UK government introduced in any future bills. Is that what you said? Just to clarify. Well, uh, the, the Scottish, I mean, when it comes to employment rights, the Scottish Parliament would not be able to reintroduce rights that say that are now, say, let's just take a concrete example, uh, say that the right to annual leave under the uh, you know, working time regulations, 1998, um, falls within, uh, uh, is, is a reserved matter. And if the um, UK uh, government said, and, and it's also retained EU law, or will be retained EU law under the EU withdrawal bill, so the UK government might say, look, we'd like to loosen this right or make it subject to additional qualifications and introduces legislation to that effect, then the Scottish government could not, uh, the Scottish Parliament could not uh, introduce uh, legislation to counter that. That's what I mean. Okay, that, that's yeah. very helpful, thank you. Um, and that leads me on nicely to uh, my next question. Uh, in the Act, uh, in part two of the Act, um, specifically sections two and three, uh, it talks about a, a number of terms around types of legislation. Uh, it uses the, the terms, there are four different terms used on this page, it's page two of the bill, uh, if it's helpful. Uh, devolved EU-derived domestic legislation is mm -hmm. the first one. EU-derived domestic legislation is the second. Devolved direct EU legislation is the third. And direct EU legislation is the fourth. Okay. Um, uh, do you have any understanding or could help the committee understand the difference between those four terms? Because I'm struggling. Okay, I can, I can try. Um, so, section two addresses EU-derived domestic legislation, which is basically, these are, um, it's, the same, um, it's the same terminology as is used in the EU withdrawal bill. So, sections two, three, and four are largely copy and paste exercises. The only difference in the end is that there's a devolved as an adjective uh, put in front simply to make clear that this relates to devolved matters only. So what uh, EU-derived domestic legislation is supposed to mean in section two, that is um, they are mainly EU directives that have been implemented. Now under the, the its UK practice under the EU, uh, European Communities Act 1972, usually when an EU directive comes down, a member state has ex cu a couple of months to, to change its law in order to make it compliant. And the UK has adopted uh, the approach that all of this is done by, by ministers, by way of secondary legislation. Uh, and the basis for that is in the European Communities Act. And um, so there, there, there are tons of statutory instruments in both Scottish statutory instruments and Westminster ones um, that have implemented EU uh, directives. So there is the, the working time regulations that I've just mentioned. There is uh, the environmental impact assessment regulations, bracket Scotland, because that's a devolved matter, and so on and so on. And there are thousands of them. Uh, and the reason we need section two after Brexit is because the European Communities Act will be repealed by the EU Withdrawal Bill. And the European Communities Act is the hook in legislation on which all of these, from which all of these uh, uh, um, statutory instruments are hanging. And if the hook is cut off, they will disappear, legally speaking. So we need a new hook. Uh, and that new hook is section two of the EU Withdrawal Bill. And for 
Our purpose is here for devolved statutory instruments. It is going to be uh, Section 2 of the Continuity Bill. Okay, so this Section 2 in the, uh, the Scottish Continuity Bill, how does that differ from the UK's EU, uh, EU withdrawal bill? It doesn't or, differ, or is it just copy-paste? It doesn't differ greatly. Okay. Um, the, the, the only difference really is uh, at the end, for the purposes of this section, EU-derived domestic legislation is devolved if and to the extent that it makes provision that it is within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. So it just, it's, it's an aspect of Section 2 of the EU withdrawal, but it's the devolved bit. Mm -hmm. And so that word devolved is, I think, the key here, because yeah. uh, it specifically relates to the approach that this bill takes. Um, who defines what is devolved and what is not? Is that just uh, in, in relevance to the Scotland Act, or uh, are there other definitions of how you decide what is devolved or what is not? Well, if you look at this definition, uh, it seems to uh, make, uh, well, an implied reference to the uh, competence of the Scottish Parliament. Right. Yeah. So the test we would have to conduct with each and every instrument is, if this were adopted now from scratch, would it be within the competence of the Scottish Parliament to do so or not? Okay, so Ignoring the limitations arising from EU law, of course. Right, so in that sense then, the, 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 the way to define whether something is devolved or reserved is whether it would fall within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament in whichever way that competence is generally yeah. assured. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Frankovic, uh, last. Um, Gone, I want to just clear something up. So Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act, mm -hmm. which lists reserved powers, the, the normal way of determining whether something's reserved or devolved is if it's not on the reserved powers list, it's therefore devolved. Is that yeah. your interpretation? Right, yeah, it was mine too. I just wanted to make sure. Jamie. Thank you. No, that's, that's helpful. Um, it's a very short section uh, in the bill, um, which is uh, in part 2, section 8. Uh, there are two, two clauses there. Um, I just wondered if you could uh, walk us through those two short sentences okay. around what, what, this, what Frankovich means in, the, in relation to this Scottish Continuity Bill. So this is, you can also find what is here in Section uh, 8.1, you can find in the EU Withdrawal Bill, I believe in Schedule 1. And it says that there is no right in Scots law on or after exodate to damages in accordance with the rule in Frankovich. Now, that is cryptic if you don't know what the rule in Frankovich is. Now, um, the European Court of Justice introduced a new remedy into EU law in the early 1990s. That is a remedy to state liability. So the state has to pay damages if, a, if the member state has violated or, or breached EU law, and if that then caused somebody a loss. Now, the, 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 the test is a sufficiently serious breach. It's quite a high hurdle. It's very difficult to show. In any event, the uh, Clause 8 says that after Brexit, there shall be no claim under this rule. It differs slightly from the approach in the EU withdrawal bill because it says here that um, Frankovich damages can still be claimed in relation to any action that accrued before Brexit Day, whereas the EU withdrawal bill doesn't, won't, won't admit any more of those actions after exit day. So there, there's a slight difference. So in, in, but generally speaking, this right to state liability, which, is a, which, is, which belongs to the law of delict, broadly speaking, it's, it's, a, it's a private law remedy, will no longer be available after uh, 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 Brexit. So the, the key difference here is that um, in both bills, after exit day, um, there is no right to damages in Scots mm. law. That exists in both bills. Mm. But where this bill differs is that if the action took place before exit day, yeah. there is still assumed there is still liabil potential liability after exit day, whereas that does not exist in the UK withdrawal bill. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's okay. I understand. Uh, what does uh, eight two uh, say then uh, in relation to transition periods? Because I think this is perhaps where it's less obvious what happens after exit day, um, but yeah. during a transition period, because exit day is defined also in this bill. So. Yes, I mean the the bill gives powers to Scottish ministers to define to define exit day because we still don't know what that's actually going to be. Um, so this uh, makes reference to Section 32, and th Section 32 is quite a broad power uh, for ministers 
to make regulations um, which they consider appropriate for the purposes of, in connection with, or for giving full effect to this act or any provision made under it. This is an extremely broad power to amend, including a right to amend the act itself, which is also found in the EU withdrawal bill. Um, I suppose the, the main purpose of this is to allow ministers to react to political developments between the passage of the Act and what happens in the EU-UK, EU-Scottish, UK-Scottish relationship in order to make the Act work so it doesn't have to go back to the Parliament. Even though I believe that um, they, if, if the Act itself is amended, there'll be uh, an affirmative procedure here so the Parliament will have something to, to say. Okay, so it, it, just to clarify, if there's a so-called transition period or an interim mm. period uh, which occurs after exit day yeah. for a, a defined period as agreed between the UK and the EU, would, Scott, would there be um, any right to damages in Scots law during that transition period? I think that's what's unclear. Y yes, but... Uh, and I, when I, would that the liability end? Okay, um, so there, there are two things here. The first is I, I don't think this bill makes provision for the transitional period at all. I think it is the intention at the Westminster level certainly to introduce a separate bill to provide for that because it'll simply be, well, first of all, we don't know what the exact uh, ramifications are. And um, so that there will probably be a separate bill dealing with the uh, transition period. And the way this bill will work is probably either it will not enter into force, exit day will be defined to mean somewhere, sometime after transition or when transition ends, or it will only partly be enacted. Uh, because during transition, all these powers given to ministers to amend the law can't be used. It would be contrary to the, what the transition agreement is probably going to say. And that also means that during transition, all the remedies that we currently have under EU law will continue as they are now. So Clause 8 will, pro probably, will only properly kick in after transition, is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. I want to, because a few other folk want to get in and we're running out of time. Mary, you wanted to come in a quick supplementary on Very Frankovic. tiny supplementary on, on the question that um, Jamie asked about Frankovic, because I think we need to be really clear that the, the, the inclusion of um, Frankovic in this bill and in the EU bill, the bar is set so high in Frankovic that it, it would be highly unlikely that, that this would have any impact on anyone living in, in the UK. Well, I mean, it would have impact. I mean, there, there will probably be a, a, a handful of people that might lose out. I mean, Frankovic, but it's most of them won't be individuals, but mm -hmm. it'll be big companies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, from what I can tell, I mean, I did a little bit of a study on on on, on case law since Frankovic, mm. and the success rate is very low because you have to show not only that there's been a sufficiently serious breach of EU law, which is very, very, I mean, it's not just any breach of EU law, but it has to be serious, so it has to be an obvious breach, and so on and so on, and that doesn't happen that often. Uh, and then you have to show that whatever right there is in, in, in a provision is, is, is aimed at you as, as, as an applicant, and then you have to show a loss. And all of these three elements combined are relatively difficult to, mm. to show. So there have been cases, yes. Uh, um, in most cases, I believe the, the winners uh, um, were um, corporations. And, you know, mm. So I don't think it would be a human rights catastrophe if Frankovich, uh, Frankovich went. At the same time, I don't fully understand why it's been being excluded either. I mean, I, I don't see an objective reason why the, the, the damages a, 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 a remedy should not continue to, to be present in Scots law for those cases where mm. a public authority breaches uh, uh, rights under um, EU law uh, mm. in the future. Okay, that's helpful because that's something we can explore further. Thank you. Thank okay, you. a quick question for myself, Tobias, and I've got a final question from Alex because I know we need, you need to get to, to the other committee. 
it's my understanding that losing the charter creates significant gaps in uh, human rights uh, law because it goes further than the Human Rights Act mm. does. Um, when we don't have any sort of a direct equivalence in some parts of uh, UK human rights law, and you'll understand that the equalities aspects of human rights law as, and human rights law as it applies to devolved matters is, reserved to, is, is devolved to this place, but the actual legislation is, is reserved to the, to the other place. And I, I, I wonder if it's your feeling um, because some of these things include, you know, the, the right to non-discriminatory practice and the protection of children and uh, human trafficking and all of those things that we have discrete law in Scotland on. And I wonder if it's your view that those gaps, if we don't enshrine the charter in Scots law, then there, there, there will be huge gaps there and those rights that people currently have um, and enjoy would be lost. Is, is that your thoughts? Well, I, I think the Charter would create a gap. Uh, uh, that is true. I mean, there, there are certain rights that we don't find in the Human Rights Act. We, we have an express uh, reference to children's rights in there. I know there is a separate effort here in Scotland to incorporate the, the UN uh, Children's Rights uh, Convention, but uh, that we, do, we don't have uh, otherwise where there, there would be... Um, there, there, there is a potential gap which hasn't quite... We don't really know yet how the European Court of Justice will interpret all those social rights that are in the Charter. Um, with equality rights, it's, um, it's a bit more difficult to say. I mean, there is no general principle of equality under the Human Rights Act, of course, yeah. but we have the Equality Act 2010, which is based on uh, EU directives and which goes beyond <laughs> EU directives as well. But of course, it's outside the hands of this parliament to do anything about uh, the Equality Act 2010. Um, so, but at the same time, I should stress that the Charter only applies where we're implementing EU law. Yeah. Um, so, and and that, that limits its effects quite dramatically because if you're talking about really human rights sensitive issues for this parliament, like you know housing, these kinds of issues, uh, the NHS, the Charter simply doesn't apply because it's nothing to do with EU law. Okay, okay, thank you. Alex. Thank you, convener. And firstly, apologies for my late arrival. Um, thank you for coming to see us today, Tobias. You've given us a very comprehensive view as to this, uh, the impact of sections two and five in respect of uh, reading across EU law into Scots law and indeed the, uh, enshrining the principles of the fun Charter of Fundamental Rights. I wonder if you're in a position to give us a view on uh, section 13, which is uh, what happens after uh, Scotland and the UK leave the EU in respect of keeping pace so that um, by uh, regulation Scottish ministers can over a period of 15 years by extension uh, can adopt um, EU changes in EU law and indeed potentially changes to the uh, charter uh, into Scots law by regulation without mm. recourse to Parliament. My concern about this is that um, we will lose the scrutiny that primary legislation can afford and with it things like the child rights impact assessment, the equalities impact assessment and, and in effect it removes that, that tier and, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that what the EU would do would be counter to those but there may be a divergence of a view as to um, where our moral compass lies as a nation. Do you have a view to, do you think that 13 should be changed to give Parliament more scrutiny over that? Well, I mean, the, the first thing to note is, of course, that Section 13 does not have an equivalent in the EU withdrawal bill. So there's no provision made at, at the UK level for ministers to keep step with EU law uh, uh, in that manner. Now, in a, in a way, of course, Section 13 mirrors uh, uh, what we have at the moment in uh, the European Communities Act 1972, where ministers are given powers to implement EU directives and keep, in, keep, in, uh, keep the UK legal system uh, in step. Of course, in the future, there will no longer be a legal obligation to do so. That's why we've got Section 2 of the European Communities Act. Here, we would have this as a, a voluntary measure, and it seems to be if I read it correctly, in the discretion of the minister to decide whether they want to uh, uh, um, adopt a, a piece of EU legislation or not. So that is uh, 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 one thing. I mean, 
scrutiny is, is indeed a, a, an issue here, um, but it is a difficult, I mean, it's of course a difficult balance to, to strike. If, you, if the intention is to do this on a regular basis, then this parliament might be swamped with uh, bills that you know, change tiny technical details on, uh, in, in the field of agriculture and should probably be, uh, spend its time better. At the same time, there, there is, because there's a lot of discretion also on part of the ministers to omit bits of the EU legislation, there is, of course, a, a potential um, for little democratic scrutiny uh, um, uh, of, of, these, uh, of these measures, and that might be something the Parliament may want to rethink, perhaps, or tighten the, tighten the, 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 the requirements a little bit more. Thank you. That, that chimes with what I'm thinking. That's okay. Are there any quick final points? No? We know that you're keen to get off to the, the other committee to advise. We're very grateful for your time this morning. It's always very helpful in allowing us to understand what that all means. And that's very important thank in you. our scrutiny of the, the work going forward. Um, we hope to hear from you again soon, but thank you. Thank so you very much. much. I'm now going to move into suspension to move into private session. Thank you. I'm so sorry.